welcome to RPG Heroes, a podcast where every other week I speak to a true hero in the realm of role-playing games about their journey, their craft, and their views. As your host, I will focus on one particular aspect of this wonderful hobby for the interview, regale you with stories from my own 25 years of experience with role-playing games, and reflect on the major takeaways from the interview. Join me now on this epic journey and awaken the hero in you. Welcome to episode 22 of RPG Heroes. And today we're going to be talking about role-playing games in education. And by education, I do mean actual schools or colleges, etc. And how we could approach using role-playing games in our lessons or teaching students to play role-playing games or maybe an after-school RPG club. And to help us with that, uh, later on I'll be talking to the hosts of the Detentions and Dragons podcast. But first, I think I owe most of my listeners an apology. Um, You might be used to my bi-weekly scheduling, uh, where every other week you have a new episode in your favorite podcast player. And uh, all of a sudden, last week, there wasn't one. And I'm very sorry. Uh, Life simply got a bit hectic, and I really couldn't make time to do an interview or record an episode. And even if I could have made time, I wasn't in the right frame of mind. But don't worry, I'm all right. I'm alive. I'm kicking, uh, whatever that means. So I'm back to releasing episodes every other the week. Don't worry. And if you want to support my efforts with this podcast, there are several ways to do so. Pretty much every episode has links in the show notes to products that you can buy on DriveThruRPG, and I have an affiliate agreement with DriveThruRPG, so I get a small percentage of whatever you buy. So it doesn't cost you anything extra, uh, but it does kick back a, uh, a buck or two to me, which is wonderful. Another way that you can support the show, of course, is to join the Patreons, uh, who support me financially through that website. And now there's an exciting new way to support me, which is by buying some RPG Heroes swag, as they say, from tpublic.com. There's a link in the show notes. Check it out. Okay, I'll stop it now. Um, One last thing before we get started on the actual topic. There's going to be some new bonus XP episodes coming out soon, which are in the form of a short review of RPG products that I have used myself and um, that I think are worth talking about. So uh, keep an eye out for those. So, role-playing games in education. I think there's a few topics that we can cover about this. Uh, One is, what can you actually learn from role-playing games? Two is, how can you actually use role-playing games at your school or college? Whether it's in your lessons or as a lesson or as an extracurricular activity. And, I think, adjacent to this, how do you actually teach young people to play and like role-playing games? And starting off with the first one, which is what you can learn from role-playing games, well, that's kind of what uh, made me do this episode in the first place. I think a lot of people who don't know role-playing games, who don't know them well enough, uh, underestimate how much you can actually learn from playing and running role-playing games. And that those things that you learn from these games are very marketable when it comes to putting it on your resume and getting a job thanks to it. And not just nerdy jobs, but any kind of job. In fact, if you look at my resume, um, which I'm not going to send to you, but um, if you look at my resume, it actually has role-playing games on it, always. And often it leads to interesting parts of the interview when I get into invited to an interview. Whether it's for a a job in education, which I have now, uh, but before I've also worked in business, where I I was a trainer and a coach. And um, yeah, in in all of those, um, the topic of what actually is this thing that is on your resume helped me to create an interesting part of the conversation. But also it allowed me to showcase some of the skills that I have learned from playing these games and running them. And they are skills such as improvising, which I think is, um, you know, when, when you know role-playing games, that's pretty much a given that, that you learn to improvise. But the, the question is, of course, what's the point? What is the use of that? Well, improvising, I think, is a skill that is appreciated in pretty much any line of business, any sort of job. And also outside of work-related stuff, it can help you in normal life. Just dealing with an unexpected situation, staying calm, and thinking outside the box and learning 
how to adapt to a situation, I think is, is good in any, any kind of part of life. Um, teamwork is another one I think that that's featured quite heavily in role-playing games. You have to learn to trust other people to do their part. Uh, you need to learn that your role in a group effort is limited to a specific set of things and that that's okay and that people will rely on you for this and then you can rely on them for that. Uh, also, coordinating your efforts uh, in a very complicated battle situation in a game um, you're doing a lot of coordinating well you go here and then I'm gonna wait here in the shadows and then the wizard will do this and blah 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 so all this coordinating is actually a super useful skill again in in uh, in your professional life as well where often you have to do these sort of things a lot of role-playing games feature problem solving. There's some sort of problem to solve, whether it is combat or a puzzle or a trap or a social situation. It doesn't matter what it is, you have to solve something. And um, uh, once you do that enough, that muscle in your brain starts to grow and you become really good at it. Tackling problems from unexpected angles, uh, using each other's mm, ideas, etc., and kind of bouncing off each other to, to solve something all wonderful skills um some basic arithmetic obviously when you roll dice and you have to add up numbers and all these kind of things you, you know if you do that enough you get better at it quicker at it um and then there are two maybe that that to some of my listeners are less obvious um one being empathy so playing a role-playing game has taught me at least to become better at Imagining what it's like to be someone else, and especially to be someone that is not like me. So I, every now and then I try and challenge myself by creating a character that is very much not like me when it comes to personality and skills and all those kind of things, their features, I guess. And um, yeah, what over the years that has really helped me to um, yeah to become better at putting myself in somebody else's shoes for a little while and, and figuring, oh, okay, this is how they might see this situation. This is how they might react because blah, blah, blah. Uh, and uh, in my job as a teacher, that's incredibly useful. And then last but not least, for at least the uh, people who are not native speakers of the English language, well, a lot of role-playing game products are published in English mostly. Yeah, some are translated, but um, if I look at my shelf here with role-playing games, they're all in English. And so the fact that I played a lot of role-playing games and that I tried to learn them and, and, and run them, etc., has forced me to read a lot of English stuff. Now, I say forced in, in maybe that's not appropriate in this case, but... Um, what it does is it, it asks you to read a lot in English with quite a lot of technical terms, quite a lot of uh, usually historical terms if, if we're talking about fantasy or historical games. And um, yeah, all this reading has been really good for my English proficiency. Um, in fact, we, we tend to even do the role play parts of our games with all Dutch people uh, in English. Um, and for me at least, because it sounds better. And as you'll see in the interview part of the episode, um, it, when we're talking about younger people uh, who might not initially be that interested in reading, it can actually uh, help them to become interested in reading and become better at it. Whereas for me, myself, I mean, I was already an avid reader by the time I had my, got my hands on my first player's handbook. Uh, let's be clear about that. Um, but, you know, especially with young kids these days, uh, it can be very, very helpful to get them interested in picking up a book and actually reading the pages. So as you can see, and I'm sure this is not all of it, but as you can see, there's a lot of very marketable skills actually that you can learn from playing a lot of role-playing games. And if you run a lot of games, you can add even more to the list about how you manage the group, how you plan your events, etc. Um, and so I would urge you, if you haven't already, put role-playing games on your resume the next time you apply for a job and see what happens. Now then, role-playing games at school. My Personal experience is limited to running an after-school D&D club or role-playing game club at the school that I worked for uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I really, really enjoyed it. At the time, I was teaching uh, 16 to, well, let's say 19 or 20-year-olds who were studying to be uh, IT professionals. And 
there were quite a few who who were interested in um, my hobbies, such as role playing games and war games, and you know they they would see my um, my laptop's uh, desktop. You know they would see the pictures on there, like oh hey, what's that? Oh, a dragon. Why why do you have that? And so we had conversations about D and D and about role playing games, and a few of them said, can you can you play that with us? And at first I thought, well, I'm your teacher, not your friend, so no. And then later I realized, but wait. They are interested in role playing games. What am I doing here? This is a this is a great opportunity for them to get into the games and for me to have a better connection with my students. So then I started the role playing game club, and pretty soon I had a whole bunch of members, and we had two different games running at the same time. And I was using Index Card RPG or ICRPG for this. Um, why? Well, it's a quick and relatively simple rule set, but also it prepares them if they want to, to also start playing Dungeons and Dragons because it uses a similar system of D20s and uh, stats like strength, dexterity, etc. My school at the time was generous enough to um, to let me use the rooms, etc. Uh, and give me some, uh, well, at least the, the, the office equipment that I needed for this, uh, so such as flipovers and pens and paper and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I had the books already, so really you don't need much to get one of these clubs going. And um, yeah, the, the, the students really enjoyed it. And one of the best moments in my teaching career to date was um, that one of these students from, from that role-playing game club, I saw him a few years later at his graduation. I wasn't working at that school anymore, but they invited me to come over and see them graduate. And they said, um, you know what, sir? I, I actually still play D&D now with my colleagues. Uh, that's all thanks to you. And I thought, wow. You know, I've I've positively influenced somebody's life and got them into this crazy hobby of ours, uh, which just really pleased me a lot. Um, yeah, so so doing this as an extracurricular activity, if you're a teacher, is not that complicated. Um, depending, of course, on the country that you live in and the rules around extracurricular activities, there might even be a budget available for it. And my long-term plan was to find in each little player group that I had in that club, uh, to find at least one or two of them who might be interested in also running the game. So to try to teach them how to do it, and so that it could grow into multiple groups where everybody had their own uh, student dungeon master and uh, I would be kind of running around and helping them out helping maybe with the prep or helping with things that happen in game um, yeah well, I never got that far because I changed um, locations but uh, yeah uh, I, I'm thinking about trying this again and um, as I had hoped it really really helped to cement my relationship with some of these students uh, including students who might have been my maybe the more quiet sort uh, so uh, I think that that's just a wonderful outcome aside from, you know, helping people find a, a new hobby and maybe make some friends at school. What I don't have any experience with, uh, but am interested in, is using uh, role-playing games in a lesson or even as a lesson. And uh, I think we can look to things like Nordic role-playing, uh, which I've talked about before on uh, the episodes about Swedish role-playing games, where um, the role-playing game takes form more as a yeah, uh, collaborative problem-solving exercise where you say, okay, this is your situation, you are in this club, uh, you are in this political party, and you are the police or whatever, uh, and let's try and figure out what happened and solve the problem. And that can teach uh, students something related to your, your subject. Uh, in my case, my subject is English, um, so I can do pretty much anything as long as it's in English. But because I work at um, uh, in a vocational education um, uh, institute, then I should try and relate it to their future jobs. Um, so currently I teach people who will become um, financially financial administrators, I guess, uh, or secretaries. And um, so I should try and relate the, the role-playing situation to that, perhaps. Maybe not, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, it would help. And in fact, as a language teacher, I constantly do sort of role-playing games uh, without the game factor. So we, we do a lot of role-plays uh, to, to get them to speak English. Okay, now a customer comes in and complains about the shoes that they just bought. What do you say? You know, that sort of thing. Uh, and these are role-playing prompts. The only thing that's missing is dice and uh, perhaps some minis and, and a map. You know? um, so there's no game element to it. Uh, but there's no one saying that you can't introduce that. Why not? Sometimes I even create a rollable table with the names of the students on it to determine whose turn is it is next. And sometimes they look at me quizzically like, why is he doing all this? And I just get a little bit of a kick out of it uh, just because it, you know, it relates to my hobby. So role-playing elements could be part of a lesson and they could even be a whole lesson unto themselves. 
Um, and it could even span multiple lessons, just like a role-playing game can span multiple sessions. And uh, why not? It, it shouldn't. There shouldn't be any reason why you cannot do that. And in fact, young people often enjoy gamifying education anyway. Uh, there's a lot of research showing that when you gamify a subject, uh, young people tend to uh, do better at that topic. In fact, there, I think there's no industry out there better at um, teaching people how to do something uh, than the gaming industry when, it, when we're talking about computer games. Computer games are excellent at getting you hooked, uh, getting you to spend lots of time and lots of effort to learn a skill which is surviving the game or solving the puzzle or whatever it is um, without you really realizing how much you're being manipulated in a positive way with little rewards, with points, with uh, achievements that you can unlock, etc. And then last but not least, I want to focus a little bit on how to actually teach young people to play a role-playing game. And, uh, well, there are many people who know a lot about this, and so I think I should kind of leave it to them to explain this in detail. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll put a, a link to a couple of good articles uh, in the show notes. And one of those is from GameInformer.com. And it's a really, really great article that tells you in a couple of simple steps what to do if you want to teach children, maybe your students or maybe your own kids or maybe your nephews or nieces or whoever. Um, some steps that to keep in mind when you think about the, a, a young mind, a, a child's mind and role-playing games. And um, so a few of the steps that they mention are, for instance, uh, start with story. That's, uh, that's what gets them interested. Um, make character creation fun. So even creating a character should be a fun little exercise. Lots of creativity, etc. Not too difficult and technical. Uh, give students, uh, students or kids options. So tell them, hey, you could do this, this or this, instead of leaving it too open and having them wonder, what am I supposed to do or say here? Um, expect some chaos. I mean, that's general with kids, uh, as I've experienced in my life. Um, and, and that's perfectly fine. That, that's part of the fun for them. Um, try and be, say a lot of yes and yes and. I think that's good advice for any role-playing game, not just with kids. And of course, pay attention to the, the players watching the time, because obviously, you know, kids have a certain uh, limited span of attention. Um, and then a couple of games that are really good for teaching children how to play role-playing games, uh, that if you're interested, so, and I'll link to those in the show notes as well, such as No Thank You Evil, which I think is just absolutely brilliant, and it has different levels of difficulty depending on the age of the players, which is great. And character creation is super uh, creative and fun and kind of visual uh, with lots of bright colors, etc. So that, that's really nice. Um, Mouse Guard is, uh, is an interesting one for younger players. Um, Happy Birthday Robot looks pretty good. Little Wizards looks very interesting. Yeah, and then of course there are the, game, the games that you already know. Um, so D&D 5th Edition, yeah, it's pretty technical and it has a lot of um, very adult themes in it. Um, it doesn't mean you can't use it for children. It just depends on how you approach it. You can leave certain things out. Um, you don't always have to focus on very yeah, the complex rules. You can just stick to the basics. And one game that I've mentioned before already is Index Card RPG, which I think is just excellent to use uh, when, when you don't have uh, very much time to go over all sorts of rules and also... Um, yeah, to, to get people interested and you don't want to intimidate them with very large volumes of text. Um, it's very quick, it's easy to learn and it is geared towards quick, fun action. And there's plenty of room for role playing. Welcome to the show, Josh and Matt, creators of the Detentions and Dragons podcast. These two gentlemen do not only share my passion for RPGs, but they are also fellow teachers. Uh, they are true heroes of the RPG world because they are teaching the next generation of players and game masters at their school. But they're also sharing their experiences with us via their podcast so that we, we may one day run an RPG club for our kids or our students. And I think that's just brilliant. Uh, they've just started season four of their podcast, so be sure to check out Detentions and Dragons. And, uh, well, welcome aboard. That was quite the glowing and magnificent introduction. Indeed. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like brimming with just like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Normally our introductions are something like 
these two teachers couldn't cut it as actual human professionals in any other field. So they decided <laughs> to go into the lackluster and thankless job of teaching <laughs> with their extremely niche podcast. So thank you. This has brought a lot of positive energy to my day. Excellent. Well, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what this show is all about is um, recognizing that there's a lot of people that do a lot of cool stuff for role-playing games. Um, so just before we dive in, uh, what do you guys teach? What, what sort of school, what sort of subjects, just so that we get an idea of what you do? Sure. Josh, take it away. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, I happen to have a license in both uh, elementary education as well as middle school science. Uh, ironically, I am actually teaching middle school English at the moment uh, <laughs> because uh, they needed an English, uh, a middle school sixth grade English teacher. So I, my license does cover that. And I, I do enjoy it because it uh, allows me to, you know, integrate a lot more of our, uh, my passion into RPG and storytelling and, and things like that. So uh, it's going really well. Mm, excellent. And just for us uh, Europeans, uh, sixth grade, what, what sort of age group would that be? Uh, that would be around 11 and 12. All right. Okay. Yep. Thank you. What yep. about you, Matt? Yes. So I, am a high school teacher in the United States in the state of Minnesota, a more of the northern area, kind of a little bit more rural portion of the United States. The age level that I teach is mostly 15 to 16 year olds, and my subject is science, and I'm a biology teacher. Okay, great. And so how did you guys get into role-playing games? Well, actually, Matt was the one who got me into it uh hmm. it was about oh seven or eight years ago all of a sudden he was like hey you know to a bunch of college friends we should do D because i've been doing it at my high school and it's really fun and you know he bought us a player's handbook for christmas and and kind of took it from there yeah so that was definitely the start of uh, i guess whatever this arcane uh, incarnation of our role-playing, I guess, career, career, <laughs> state of mind, hobby, that type of thing like that. I know for me, I have played a lot of RPG types of video games in my childhood. So like on the NES and the Super NES, those types of things like that. I played a little bit of D&D third edition when mm -hmm. I was in high school and then took a big long break and had listened to some podcasts because podcasts were getting into the actual play, real play type of scene with that. And I was getting interested in D&D that way. And then I was running a D&D club at school because a student asked me, hey, do you want to advise the D&D club? And I said, I don't really know a whole lot about this version of D&D, but sure. And then it was the first club meeting and it turned out that nobody actually knew how to play D&D. So then I figured out how to play D&D and then led my first campaign. And then that involved me getting my friends to play D&D and then the creation of a podcast, which focused specifically on introducing D&D to new players with an emphasis on students, but also catering to new DMs, new family members, those types of you know, people that might be entering the RPG scene for the first time. Excellent. And I got my uh, DM interest from watching Matt. And, uh, you know, he introduced me to a lot of interesting podcasts and uh, like watching him, you know, run the games and things. And I'm like, this would work really great with kids, yeah. you know, just the storytelling elements and, and things like that. So I started looking into it as well. And, and pretty soon it was like, here we are. We've, you know, four years into the podcast, you know, and uh, running in games and clubs for kids. It's, uh, it's been pretty rewarding. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can imagine. Yeah. And so if I understand you correctly, Matt, um, there was already an existing D&D &D club at your school. Is that right? No, it was mm. more like a student was interested in having a D&D &D club. Ah. And one of the things I am known for at my school 
is being the nerdiest teacher at the school. So we had a board game club and I was in charge of board game club. And then we had a Pokemon club. Mm -hmm. So I was in charge of Pokemon club. We were going to have an anime club, but I, I literally just did not have the time for an anime club. So I said, no, I'll find another teacher for anime club. So anytime (laughs) there was something that was like student driven and also leaned into the traditional nerdier type of pastime, people went to Mr. Keel for it. So (laughs) so I was presented with the opportunity to run the D&D club and then I realized I had to take a little bit more, I don't know, of an authoritative approach to it. And now it's not just being the manager, but being the teacher of it as well. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's excellent. And and so, uh, Josh, if, if I understand correctly, then you started the whole thing at your school. Mm-hmm. Yep. I had um, kind of had an inspiration to run something called Havoc Quest with my fifth graders when I used to teach fifth grade about four or five years ago Mm -hmm. and uh, had a class that really just needed a lot of like help socially and kind of motivationally getting stuff done. And I was like, you know what? Okay. How about this? You get your stuff in, you get your, your homework turned in, you do your reading minutes. I'm going to reward you with a game day. And it's not just like board games or things like that. Like, we're going to actually play the game. And I, I made up my own character sheets that were more kind of fifth grader friendly. And we kind of like, I took apart like the 5e D and D system and like simplified a lot of the rules and stuff. And we created Havoc Quest and the kids loved it. Oh my mm. goodness gracious. We got little gold coins. I had like kids who'd never turned in reading minutes at all like all of a sudden just be like reading tons of material and just getting tons of stuff in the coins would then be used for buying stuff for their character that they could then like level up and boost their character um within the game to do Mm -hmm. and it it really took off and then from there i had a bunch of kids were like well could we possibly play outside of the classroom because like we only get an hour in class and i'm like "Mm -hmm." Okay, let me see what I could do. And, yeah. and, and with a small group, uh, we started a D&D club just after schools on Friday. And pretty soon more kids heard about it. And it kind of grew until right until about COVID last year, we had 55 kids and nine student DMs uh, mm-hmm. within, a, like, within the club. And it was, it was intense. I, I kind of took a step back at that point and kind of became the manager of all yeah um stepping in when a dm was sick and things like that but it it went really well and um unfortunately yeah covid Mm -hmm. so yeah uh we're kind of back to a smaller group online this time so but yeah no that's kind of the origin of the north branch D D club Okay. Wow. And so uh, you started actually doing this in the classroom. So how, how big is this class? So like how many students? Uh, back then I had a class of about average of 31 to 34, depending on, cause they would switch out with me. Right. And so it was a lot of, a lot of RP, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of uh, kind of management, you know, we're going to group you three together. What are you three going to do? Mm. Okay. You're facing a zombie ogre. What are you doing? And just yeah. having them working together, um, yeah. which again, really met the goal of promoting a lot of social co- cohesion and teamwork and cooperative, mm-hmm. uh, co- like cooperative storytelling. Yeah. And a lot of the like friction that I was seeing at the beginning of the, the school year where kids just weren't getting along kind of disappeared uh-huh. because it was like, okay, well, I'm, I'm playing a game with you and we're having fun. Yeah. And, you, and, you know, it, it just kind of, it just kind of melded away. Hmm. But that, that's very interesting. So you had basically 30 ish players. Mm-hmm. All at which, once. which was a bit of a challenge, but yeah. uh, we, we made it work and kids learned patience and uh, kind of how they could work their way into the story. Um, mm-hmm. Now we're doing, I'm doing the same thing again with my English class. Uh, it kind of is a hybrid of choose your own adventure 
um, and then journal about it and actual playing. Uh, we now have an average of 18 to 21 kids. So it's a little bit more manageable, but still yeah. a big, bigger group. Wow. Yeah. yeah. My, my groups max out at five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good number to have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, and I think for you, Josh, this version of D and D in the classroom isn't necessarily your traditional. Oh yeah, no version of the mm -hmm. game. So you're yeah. taking a lot of these elements, and it's sort of like collaborative storytelling with stats, which is of course D and D, but yeah. it is a modified version so that mm -hmm. it is possible to get all the different players involved uh, within the story. And I know that you have different versions of the game where like sometimes it's that hour at the end of the week where you're really focused on the narrative while other times there might be an academic lesson where you're integrating like concepts like for before like concepts of physics into mm -hmm. solving some sort of like D, D riddle and then they get yeah. feedback as they're developing and solving um certain clues in, in like the dungeon but the clues are just like different questions that's part of like a lab study guide uh, that type of thing mm -hmm. like that and it so, it, it really in, uh, helped integrate a lot of stuff but yeah no this is definitely this is definitely a collaborative storytelling with D and D influence yeah. to it. Oh, okay, yeah. And is there a an actual system out there that you can buy for this, or is this is more something you created? This is this is something I kind of created. I do have if if people email me, I do send them out like a have a quest game packet. But again, it's it's very much very loose D and D five E rules yeah. and character yeah. creation steps. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so there, there's a, there's a market. <laughs> there, there is a market that we're finding um, yeah. a lot. There, we've interviewed several people who have been very successful at like integrating a lot of this. Mm -hmm. We just uh, talked to uh, Ashley Smith and uh, Brandon um, at uh, one of our local wildlife uh, centers they do a ecology class hmm. uh, with a lot of school uh, with a, a couple classes and yep. their program is absolutely amazing like mm -hmm. hands-on they're doing uh, biology and like actual field research um, and tying it into the game and it's just hmm. it's amazing to see that yeah wow okay yeah so that's very interesting because I, I was wondering you know I would assume most people just grab a book of D and D or something else, and you know you start playing. But yeah, when you think about you know the age group and possibly also the the situation, if you're in a classroom and you have to kind of explain to your boss why you're doing you know <laughs> what you're doing. So what what about um, support from the school? How does that work? Like, is this something you do in your own time or? Well, for me, my D, D experience within the classroom within high school is strictly as an extracurricular activity. Mm -hmm. I teach 10th grade life science biology. Yeah. I love the idea of integrating these types of uh, like games and story driven collaboration at the high school level. I do not have the time to you know, utilize that. So mm -hmm. I think it's really cool that Josh is able to do that with yeah. some of the younger students. So for me, the experience is completely as an extracurricular activity. So there's not really a huge academic component to it. Mm -hmm. The school that I work for, as long as I didn't get paid for it, they were hundred percent okay with me running it. They had no problem. <laughs> so just, yep, yeah. the room's open. And yeah. yeah, I've always had a lot of support from my administrators and the other teachers within my school. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right. I, I would, I would say that that is true here as well. Um, as far as a club goes, I like they are loving that we, you know, again, we're running a club. Um, I've heard yeah. from both my administrators as well as like other people within the districts, including social workers and things when they're dealing with kids, it's something that gets mentioned and, mm. and, you know, they're like, I've had a couple of people stop in and like, Oh, they're here. Oh, that one's oh, good to see them doing, you know, getting involved with something and things like yeah. that. So it's, it's definitely been a viewed as a positive. Um, and even within the classroom, um, I hear a lot from parents that kids come to school, like super excited 
And, oh yeah, I got my homework done because if I don't, I don't get to play like Havoc Quest. Yeah, yeah. And it's been a, a really big motivator. So yeah, I, I think positive all around. Hmm. Yeah. And so, so do, do gaming companies uh, do anything to help schools do this? Or have you experienced anything like that? that maybe Wizards of the Coast or other groups kind of reaching out to you and say, hey, uh, did you know well, that? Yeah, I think that there are a lot of people who are very supportive. I know that I think Wizards of the Coast does certain things where maybe they provide like certain materials to certain schools, and, but it's on a very like, 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 um, one-on-one -on -one basis case. type yeah. of thing. Um, mm. I, I know that we've never been contacted, but I know that other teachers who have worked in different areas, different schools, Wizards of the Coast have reached out um, to them uh, for their support. Mm -hmm. I think one of the purposes of Detentions and Dragons is really to show teachers that this is something that you can approach with your students and yeah. you actually don't need a whole lot of financial resources. I'm, mm. I'm not sure about you. I, um, being a teacher yourself, but I yep. think you probably are very, like very familiar with the idea that your budget may not necessarily be as large as you would like it to be. So yeah. you like us are, constantly finding like clever ways and cheap ways to do things within the classroom. And for example, I always try to emphasize to anybody who is interested in starting their own club, like do not be limited by like the lack of your budget because yeah. D&D publishes their whole basic rule set for free. They publish a lot of the core classes, spells, mm. monster list, you basic rules. They, yeah, mm. they have yeah. all those things for free. So yeah. if you're the person who is saying, oh, I can't get started until my students each have their own player's handbook, like you're never going to get started. Yeah. But if you show them the link and said, hey, here's a PDF that has 80% of the rules in it, then you have just taken one step closer to getting started in that club. And there are so many different free adventures out there. That dice rollers. Do. There's yeah. dice rollers. So while it would be awesome for more organizations, companies to contribute more to education, number mm -hmm. one, I think that there probably are a lot that mm -hmm. are doing it. They're just not uh, doing that for our specific club. But I think yeah. there's so many like free resources out there that yeah. – uh, it really shouldn't hold anybody back. And there's been some other companies like I know Cobalt Press, uh, Wolfgang Bauer um, mm -hmm. sent us a whole bunch of Midgar stuff, which is an RPG um, similar to to D and D and such. Uh, he sent us a whole bunch of things, mm -hmm. and I know he sends uh, other things out to um, schools and and such like that. I know there's a whole mm -hmm. bunch of dice companies that do as well. Um, so yeah, there's it's just it's very circumstantial. In yeah. some regards, yeah. Okay, hmm. and so uh, when when you look at um, using role playing games in the classroom or teaching uh, school kids to play D anD D, what what would you say are the most important things to realize if you want to try and do this? Sure. Let's focus first, maybe on just teaching kids to play D anD D. And then, Josh, <laughs> if you want to talk about some of the educational aspects, because they're really two different beasts that you're mm -hmm. looking at. Mm -hmm. yep. How to integrate it into standards-driven curriculum versus how do you just get the students uh, into an actual game of D anD D? Because mm. it is very difficult. The rules are free, but there's a lot of them. And mm -hmm. if you expect anybody to read a book beforehand. They're not going to. Nope. Um, so you definitely have to keep some things uh, in mind. I mean, you basically put instructions on there. Turn your paper into Google Classroom. Like mm -hmm. you write it six times and they, they turn in a blank document. Like yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> to try to put D&D &D instructions on there. It's, yeah. that, is, that is a bit of a challenge there. Mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. so I would say my first piece of advice is when you're going to run D&D &D with kids, the number one thing that you want to do is you want to make it fun. Mm -hmm. And what this means is going to really vary from group to group. You might have a group of kids who don't like the combat version 
of D and D, and they really like the social like aspects of it. And you might find a group that's vice versa. They really like the combat, and they really don't care about talking to NPCs and that type of thing like that. Yeah, the rules are important, but the number one thing is you need to find what is going to make the game fun for everybody because like the most important thing is this is a game and if the game's not fun then what's the purpose of playing the game and in another way you're going to lose all of your students from your D club because they're going to know that this is not actually a thing that they want to do it's just yeah. a chore so yeah. find what makes it fun even if you have to bend the rules fudge the dice rolls maybe give those kids a plus three, you know, play big <laughs> yeah. sword at like level two. Yep. You do what you need to do to make the game fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So um, as far as like, any, I guess standard wise, the, the big thing would be to take a look at like, what is your state standard? What is your, your school standard for the lesson? Mm-hmm. And you know, is there, is there a place for it? Not every lesson is going to have a spot where you can RP it. Like if you deal with like, I don't know, calculus, mm. it's really hard to be like, okay, roll plus, you know, yeah, yeah. what I, I don't know what, cal- I don't know. Cal- it's hard. I don't know. But <laughs> it's why I teach middle school, but you know, it, it, you have to pick and choose. You can't, yeah. you can't force it. And I found, I found that out um, the hard way my first year's doing, you know, doing this, like not everything is going to fit. Yeah. So you have to, you have to pick and choose. And sometimes you're like, yeah, sorry, we're going to play just havoc as fun. We're going to, we're going to just do it. It's not going to be as much. Um, but there are some times where it really does fit. And, and I think the kids really enjoy it and they get a lot more out of it when they get to role play and experience it hands on. Okay. So, yeah, perfect. Yeah. All right. Um, and so in, in general, learning to play a, a role-playing game. So you mentioned uh, that so that you should focus on the fun and the rules well, they, mm-hmm. come later. Is there anything else that, that you've learned over the years that helps people to, to learn a role-playing game or to learn even how to role-play? Because that, that's not easy for some. Yeah, definitely. So the, I would say another major piece of advice is you have to model the behavior Mm -hmm. that you want from your players. Definitely. For example, if I'm rolling dice, I am always explaining what I'm doing and Mm -hmm. how I'm rolling for dice. So I I might say like, Oh yes, this monster is going to make a perception check to see if he can actually see you. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to roll my perception. And then I might say something like, Oh, I rolled a 10 plus two for a perception of 12, but your passive perception is 13. So he's not actually able to see you. So it almost gets like almost too repetitive, especially if you're a person who's experienced with D&D, you don't need to hear everything, like single thing explained every single time. But Mm -hmm. when you start modeling your dice rolls, when you are the person who is Mm role-playing, then you're using your funny voice, then that sort of gives the students permission to use their funny voice or even redirecting them to say, like, they're like, oh, I want to go to the store. It's like, well, what does, how does your character say that? So redirecting them to do those certain types of behaviors that you've modeled before um, is a great way to do that. Um, another thing, kind of jumping from that point to a different point is sometimes it's good to give your students options or your, your new players options when they are beginning their career as a D and D player. One thing that D and D is great at is being this huge open potential sandbox where you can do everything. But if you don't know the rules of the universe and you don't know what everything is, it gets really intimidating and you end up like not doing anything. So a lot of times what I do with my newer players, I will say, okay, well, there is a fire castle in the East and there's an ice dungeon in the West. Do you all want to go to the fire castle or to the ice dungeon? And then I make the vote and then whatever the majority you know, votes for it. It's like, well, your group has decided that the best decision is to go to the fire castle and to the, 
outside of like observer, especially if you haven't done a lot working with kids and teenagers or just like teaching things, mm -hmm. it's really important to provide that scaffold, to mm -hmm. give them these choices. And then once you see them gain this confidence in their abilities to act within the narrative, then you can kind of scaffold it back a little bit and let them try to make their own choices. So another, I guess my takeaway, just don't expect too much out of them. Model yeah. those behaviors and redirect them to like succeed in the game by giving them little hints what they should do. And I'm gonna I'm gonna jump off of what Matt said there, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bridge it a little bit with one more thing. There's nothing wrong with kind of jumping in and leading by example and giving suggestions. Like one of the, like a lot of times when I'm with a bigger group of kids. And there are some kids who've never, ever even played a video game or an RPG of any sort. Or like, you know, you're in middle school. The concept of playing pretend is kind of like you, you haven't done it for a while. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of an odd thing to be in class and all of a sudden your teacher's asking you, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to, you know, talk to the, you know, goblin bellhop or don't you? Yeah. And I find that sometimes it's it's really easy to, with the player's permission, be like, here, I have a suggestion for you. What happens if your, your character did this? And you kind of lay it out and then they're like, well, yes or no. And that I find is an easy way for them to get involved with the game and they feel they're finding their comfort level. Yeah. And they see what you will allow in the game and then they kind of mm -hmm. pick it up and take it from there. Okay. Great. Sounds like very good advice. Um, and so if, if I would have to um, defend the idea of a DD and d club at my school, um, I, I probably would want to give some, uh, some educational benefits. So what would you say are, are the educational benefits of playing a role-playing game for you know, young people? Sure. I wasn't expecting that question. So Ooh. I'm going to have to process it. No, <laughs> I okay. yeah. am kidding. I'm just kidding. So <laughs> on the surface, mm -hmm. there is not a lot of intrinsic educational value. Is no. this going to help them with an ACT or some sort of standardized test? Hmm. No, it is no. not. It isn't going to help them to earn a better grade or get a diploma or get one of those certifications, that type of thing. So yeah. Josh would make, could make an argument that within his world, then yeah, there's like an educational component to me or to that. Uh, for me, I do not have that same educational component. So what I really try to focus on are what are these uh, social skills that the students mm -hmm. are learning? Because if we think about what school is, there is the academic component, but there's also this social component. Like we yeah. are trying to raise decent human beings on this planet yeah. and the place that you have to like really practice this in a structured environment with good role models is school so for example you could make an argument like oh what, what's the educational value of a sport and it's about learning teamwork and camaraderie and sportsmanship and all those different types of things like that yeah. so there's no educational value playing a sport, but it's still seen as a really important aspect of like a student's development. So yeah. what I would say is you take that same idea, but instead of playing the sport, this play, playing the sport, you are actually taking this to sort of more of imagination, creative level. You're taking this into the collaborative story. So all mm -hmm. of those different things that you might gain by participating in that type of activity, you're gaining within a different setting. So the same goals, just a different way to achieve those goals. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. That's, that's how I think that's kind of how I felt about it as well. Uh, especially I, I teach um, at a, yeah, I guess it's kind of like a community college, we call it okay. in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the States. So they're, they're 16 and up. Um, you know, the, the, and the group that I had, they were studying uh, uh, like for low level I, IT jobs. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. You know, a very likely group of people to be interested in role playing games in general. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so yeah, when the school asked me, so what are they learning exactly? I said, well, 
you know how to kill goblins but um but other than that you know a lot of those kids they you know they had yeah i wouldn't say that they were bad at social skills but they could definitely improve them and i said well you know improvising those kind of things um having a bit of empathy you know mm -hmm. being understanding what it's like to be someone else well um, there's a there's a lot of um there's a lot of other venues in the world that are seeing RPGs and TTRPGs as being very beneficial for the productivity of their overall company and team. I know of a couple that actually do hire GMs to come in and run like for the company D and D games. Oh, and, cool. and because it teaches, you know, cohesion and cooperation and, you know, advanced problem solving and it yeah. just it again it's not are they going to do well on an act standardized test no. no are they going to empathize with somebody and see the deeper you know meaning of why and how and what the conflict is of a situation probably you know hopefully that's the goal right yeah yeah so you know there are a lot of places that are looking at TTRPGs as a way of advancing this kind of below the level, like cohesion in groups. And, and yeah. it's really exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's becoming more and more of a, an accepted thing also. Huh? That, mm -hmm. I think that helps. Yeah. It, it's no longer like, you know, something people do in their basements and it's, it's these people over here, you know, it's yeah. like everybody's, running into D&D. It's, it's really nice to see. Yeah, absolutely. So what would you say are the best role-playing games to use at a school? I mean, obviously we talk about Dungeons and Dragons a lot because it's the most famous role-playing game out there, but uh, are there any other ones that you've experimented with? Yeah, um, I've, I've used Kids on Bikes, mm -hmm. uh, a Rogue Hat production. Uh, I used that last year, uh, right before COVID uh, kind of sent us all into distance learning. Uh, the kids really liked that one. They literally played as kids and mm. I put them on out, out on a field trip. Uh, and it was, um, yeah, it, it was very simple, very easy to explain. They created characters within 15 minutes of class. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I would recommend that one. That one was really good. And uh, let's see, Eddie, I've kind of taken monster of the week apart um and started to you know use that rule system and dice system uh possibly for a choose your own adventure game i'm hoping mm. to maybe try that out next year okay um we're gonna call it spuds uh for for a, a squeeze uh, uh what is it squeeze postal and unique delivery service uh I've got an adventure cooking, hopefully. Oh. Uh, but yeah, uh, those, those would be my two recommendations. Hmm. What about you, Matt? Well, as a person who has only run D&D &D within the classroom, I'm going to say that both of those seem like great options. And if you're ever in question about what gaming system you should use, I would say the simpler, the better is going yeah. to be something that's really important. Uh -huh. um, I like D and D because it is very popular. Clearly our podcast is named uh, in kind of the spirit of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah. Uh, but I think there are other great systems out there. Even if you go with something like lasers and feelings, which is a 2d mm -hmm. six system. Mm -hmm. And I haven't tried it yet. I want to, because something that I like about some of those simpler styles of games is it gives you a little bit more freedom for your characters to do things. Yeah. Sometimes you see the student get a little bored of their role within a D&D game. If yeah. they're the fighter, they're always attacking and maybe they use a second wind and maybe they have like a fun magic potion, but they yeah. almost get into a routine in the battle sense of it, but something where you can get really silly, really wacky, really creative uh, with a system like uh, Lasers and Feelings yeah. would be my number one recommendation uh, to lean into. Okay, perfect. Um, so one question that, that, that I have still is, um, 
So obviously you've been doing this for a while. Um, so for both of you, what, what has been the, the best and what has been the absolute worst moment uh, in your D&D club? Just so we can learn from it. Sure. My best moment and my worst moment. So my best moment is not so much. Well, I, I gotta, I have to point this out because it just makes me feel good, hmm. but it is consistently year after year, there will be some sort of point when these students are really understanding how the game works. They're playing their characters. And then like this little offhand comment, they'll say, oh, this is the only club that I've ever done in high school. Or this is like the first time I felt really welcomed at school. Like this mm-hmm. is the best part of the day. I had a student who couldn't fall asleep the night before a DM, like a, um, what do you call it? A game club meeting because uh-huh. she was so excited about what was going to happen. And it's like in a world where it's really easy to get depressed by what's happening in our surroundings and to mm-hmm. feel powerless and to live in, in a community where maybe you aren't the coolest person and you're not traditionally seen as the most successful or the most handsome mm-hmm. or the most intelligent to like know that you have a place where you can be yourself and people welcome you like that always feels good for me because yeah. sometimes it's it's work to stay after school and you're there for an hour and a half and you're developing new gameplay and missions and that type of thing and sometimes yeah. you're just thinking oh man i wish i could just go home after work yeah. because then i could go home i could take a nap i could play video games but then once you're there and the kids are having so much fun you're like oh this is not just a game like this mm. is an important memory this is like a foundational moment yeah. in these students lives and even if they don't ever play D again like you could say like i was this positive influence i was there for those students and yeah. like that is continuously the best thing that happens when I D and play when I play D and D. The worst thing that happens is I try to make the game too complicated. Mm-hmm. Now, I hope none of my students are listening to this. <laughs> I had this idea that I was going to run Tomb of Annihilation at club this year with the idea of like they would get through like a little bit of it (laughs) and i'm already about i don't know six weeks in and i'm thinking oh no i really really screwed up super super bad so i'm having to do some like major shifts and i tricked myself because one of my philosophies is make your games sort of divide them into like shorter mission-based things so that like narrative arcs can wrap up quickly. The Like the arcs don't have to really be dependent upon each other. So like sometimes you'll have a student show up for two months and then never show up again. Sometimes you'll have a student show up at the beginning of the year mm. and then you have to fit them into the story. So yeah. a really easy storyline is to say, you're all mercenaries, you all work for a guild and yeah. you're taking all these missions in order to get as much gold or as much money to then eventually fight the big bad guy. I decided I wanted to do Chalt really, really badly. And I did not realize how hard it was. And I kind of regret that. So really understand that there's a certain level of play that you're, you can expect your players to like step up to, Yeah, but you gotta maybe acknowledge Some things are going to be too hard. But then for me, I'm just like, well, we're just going to make it a simpler version. They're Mm. probably not going to get to the soul monger. That's fine. But they're going to have about seven months of adventures, fighting dinosaurs and grung and that type of thing like that. So, (laughs) All right. Great. Good answer. Thanks. What about you, Josh? Oh, it's, I, I, you know, kind of paralleling Matt's like, you know, you get the kids who are just like, you know, they're so excited for D&D and you have those moments where like, you know, they're appreciative of it because this is the only club that they get into or it's it's finally like there is a club at school that I'm excited about because it, it fits me more than sports or any other activity um, does. I, I like I just had I had a moment of at the very beginning of school where 
I like introduced myself and I had a couple kids who I knew were their older siblings. You know, I, they're right now in high school yeah. and they're like, you're the Havoc Quest teacher, aren't you? Uh. Yes, I am. Are we going to do Havoc? <laughs> we can. Would you like to? <gasps> yes, please. Oh, wow. We would really much like that. And, and, and they get, they were like really excited. And so like to know the fact that, it was enough of an impact that kids went home and they talked about it mm. and they shared these adventures on top of that. I think that like the, the greatest, like even beyond that, when you have kids connect mm. via an, um, I, I recall one particular time uh, I had one student who really was having a hard time fitting in a uh, brand new kid tried playing football out with with the rest of the kids at recess didn't really you know didn't really get the hang of it you know was was just really struggling and through havoc and the dnd that we were doing in the classroom kind of like he he came along and maybe i might have influenced a bit but he managed to get his hands on a magical item that really would save the day and like final final a game kind of down to the last couple games that we were playing like you know had everybody on the ropes the bad the big bad had everybody on the ropes and like he was like you know what i'm gonna do this and he goes and he he does you know he opens this bag and it it all of a sudden like I think I had like a massive wave of spiders come out of the bag. I think it was like the, the big bag of nope is what I called it. The big bag of nope, <laughs> yeah. because I'm not a fan of spiders mm. personally. Um, but like, I had like a giant, like ocean wave of spiders come out and just like, just finish off the big bed and everybody cheered. And the kids practically carried this kid out on their shoulders. I kid you oh, not, wow. not exaggerating, almost carried this kid out of the classroom on their shoulders. And he just had the biggest smile on his face. And he had like, he made a lot of connections with kids that day that even mm. through the last week of school and the following year, cause I had, I had kind of a concurrent, uh, concurrent uh, grade level. Uh, I went from fifth grade to sixth grade. Mm. And so I had the same group of kids he still had friends who were like talking about it and playing D and D with them. And oh. it was, it was just so cool to see that. Yeah. Uh, the worst, I, the, the bad thing with, with it is like, sometimes kids do get, have dramas. Hmm. Uh, sometimes game drama does, you know, fall out in the classroom and outside of the game. And I've, I've had to deal with a, a few of them, not very many, but hmm. one or two. And you know, it's kind of like, okay, I understand we're passionate about this. Yeah. I understand we have a lot of feelings and this, but we have to work it out. Okay. Cause this is, as, as we've said before, this is a game. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. And if it's not fun, maybe it's time to find something else to do. Yeah. And, you know, usually we were able to work things out. You know, I haven't had to like kick a player out of a, out of a club yet. And I hope I never have to, but mm -hmm. um, that I guess is like the one one bad thing that I yeah. that I've experienced. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. I thought you were going to say when you allowed all of your players to take the lucky feet. Oh, that was <laughs> terrible. I was so dumb. I was, I was, a that was a noob DM mistake right there. Oh, that was so bad. Oh, I had to nerf that real quick. It's already the worst slash best feet out there. And you allowed all of your players to have the lucky feet. Oh, I didn't, I didn't read it into it too much. And it was like, Oh, Oh, the, you know, Oh, the, the, the lich throws a spear at you. Oh, lucky it, you know, kind of a thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. And ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine that gets old real fast, very fast, <laughs> very fast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, so we're going to conclude this exam with uh, one very, very important question, which I ask every single one of my guests. Uh, and that is the question, who is your personal hero when it comes to role-playing games? Who would like to take this one first? Josh, do you have an idea? Uh, I, I, I do. I do. Um, it's a little sappy. I, I, would, I will say this. Uh, I'll start off with that. It is a little sappy. Uh, my hero is, is Mr. Matt Keel. Because uh, if if it wasn't for him, I would not probably be, you know, in doing this. Uh, D and D was not a thing that I did 
a lot back in you know my younger days and I kind of was like oblivious to it and he was the one who who you know brought this up and then has also been a very big mentor to me mm. uh as well as a, a a big you know leader for this podcast as well um but also you know showing me the ropes of of DMing which I greatly enjoy now so Matt mm. you you are a bit of my hero Josh tug at my heartstrings that makes me <laughs> feel so good so now my hero, I know this is going to sound pretty sappy, is a person that I've known for a long time. He's got a great beard and he's got a big heart and his name is Neil Powell. <laughs> so a little bit about Neil. Neil is a member of the Block Party Podcast Network he is part of some very, very well-known podcasts, including the Dungeon Masters Block and DMnastics, both which are focused on highlighting just really great people and things within the D&D community. DMnastics focuses a little bit more on the creativity portion of D&D and like what are creative elements, how do you improve your monster design, dungeon design, lore design uh, within your game. And he works so hard uh, within the network, helping to edit these podcasts, find guests, and just really bring this important message to everyone. And of course, Josh is the DM with the biggest heart I have ever known. But since I do have the opportunity, I did want to give a shout out to Neil for all the hard work that he does. He is truly an inspiration within the D and D community. Mm -hmm. I would concur. Excellent. All right. Well, I got to say, gentlemen, thank you so, so much for doing this. Uh, I think it was a, a great interview and uh, I hope that this spurs some of my listeners on to, uh, to try and do this for themselves. If they are educators or to talk to their local school and say, Hey, my kids should do this arrange something uh, that would be great Definitely. yeah yeah well thank you for having us on all right so that was interesting um yeah so i think the main takeaways from this particular interview are if you want to start teaching young people how to play role-playing games and if you want to use role-playing games at a school uh, some things to keep in mind are keep the rules relatively simple don't let them get in the way of the fun and, and the process uh, focus on choices so say would you want a b or c rather than what do you want to do and uh, focus a lot on the story what is going on get them hooked into the story into the narrative and the rest will follow um, yeah and as you notice the um, both matt and josh uh, agree with me that uh, there are many social skills that you learn from playing a role-playing game and uh, if you need uh, any kind of um, incentive for your school to support you in this um, th that could definitely be a very strong argument for it. And uh, we also can conclude that uh, you don't really need much to get started with um, a role-playing game club or anything like that at your school. Of course, you can reach out to whatever publisher of your favorite uh, role-playing game is out there and ask if, you, if they can support you somehow. But in general, you don't need a whole bunch of books and, and, and things that you don't already have. Uh, the, the players, the students don't necessarily have to have a, a player's handbook, etc., if we're talking D and D style games, and uh, well, most of us will have a you know a, a pretty good selection of dice at home that you could use. And if you if you don't have enough dice, well, you can use dice roller apps or or websites, etc. That's all not a problem at all. Uh, in other words, there's not much stopping you. So uh, yeah, let's let's make sure that every school out there has some sort of role playing game program and uh, make the world a better place that way. Well, that's it for episode 22. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording. If you did, please consider leaving a five-star review on iTunes. It really helps to get the podcast get heard. Want to keep up with the latest news about my podcast? Well, hop on over to Twitter at RPGHeroes1. Check out the full show notes with all the links at rpgheroes.buzzsprout.com. Want to support the show and join other supporters on my Discord channel? Then I would be honored if you check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash RPG Heroes. You can also buy RPG products with my affiliate code, and nowadays you can even buy RPG Heroes swag. 
So check the links in the show notes for more information. Two weeks from now, well, I'll hopefully have finished my four-year-long D&D campaign, and I want to interview at least some of the players of that campaign. So until next time, stay heroic.